Hi, I'm Rev. Wendy Craig Purcell here at the Unity Center in San Diego. Thank you so much for watching today. If you'd like to support the work that we do here, please consider making a contribution. Go to our website. It's easy to do. Thank you in advance for that contribution. This is the start of Advent, the first Sunday of Advent. There are four Sundays of Advent. You may or may not uh, know that or remember that. Some of us in Unity um, have grown up in a traditional Christian church and left that for something perhaps a little more open, a little more inclusive, a little more relevant and practical. And others who find their way into Unity have no uh, background in Christianity or formal religion. So I want to give some context to Advent as we start this celebration and this season in preparation for Christmas. And I want to make it as practical as I can. That's one of the things that really drew me into unity. I was raised in the Lutheran Church and confirmed in the Lutheran Church. And while I had very um, lovely experiences there, I felt something was missing. And part of what was missing for me was the inclusivity of the experience and the practicality of it. I needed to understand how these ancient teachings, whether it was from the Old Testament, the New Testament, or now my background pulls from all of the world's religions, I needed to make them practical. And in unity, I found that. I found a path to practical uh, Christianity, practical spirituality. So we're going to weave all of that into this celebration of Advent as we prepare for this um, as we prepare for Christmas and as we understand what the preparation is all about. When I think of Christmas, I think of a season. And for me, it typically starts with Thanksgiving and ends with New Year. It's, it's not just a day. It's a whole experience, a whole season. And though for me and probably for all of us, this Christmas season is going to be different than any that we have ever experienced before, the fact that it may be different does not need to diminish and shouldn't diminish its sweetness and its spiritual relevancy and message for us today. Now, Advent, as I said, is the celebration or the preparation for Christmas. It is the marks the four Sundays preceding Christmas, and it is something clearly that um, was created by man. It was created in the, originated in the sixth century as a way to help the early church to both prepare and to um, remember and to anticipate to prepare and to remember and to anticipate. The word Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus, which means coming or arrival. And so in this idea of, of Advent is the idea of preparing for something to come. So I want you to think about that as we move through the Sundays of Advent. What is it that you are wanting to prepare for, to bring forth in your life? It's a time of remembrance and a time of anticipation. Think for yourself about the ways that you have celebrated and experienced Christmas. And I imagine that if you do, you can recognize that there is the, the activity of remembering, remembering past holidays. Maybe as an adult, you remember special Christmases where that one thing you really, really wanted, you really, really got, or... Um, or, or songs, or meals, or the times with Santa, you know, reflecting back and remembering. Maybe you also can relate to the idea of anticipating, like, what's going to come, and how do I prepare, and how do I get ready? I know for me, the Christmas season has always had a lot of that, has always had a lot of the anticipation related to, to preparation. In so much of of Christian uh, teaching, but also I think in many of the world's religions, we rely on symbols to help 
us experience something that sometimes we just can't quite get with, with pure words. And so you see before me the Advent candles, and we use these and we light these as a way to remind us of the beautiful, sacred, and spiritual light that resides in each and every one of us. And so you see that we have four candles for the four Sundays before Christmas, and we have the center candle, the white candle, the Christ candle. You might wonder, because I always did until I did enough research, why in the world are there three purple candles and one pink candle? Was that a mistake? And no, it's not a mistake. It's part of the tradition and the ritual that comes out of the early liturgical church. The purple representing the, the richness of the liturgy and the pink being significant and just the one candle, because in the early celebration of Advent, the first two weeks of Advent were about repentance, were about were about that energy. And then starting in the third week of Advent, it was about celebration. And so the pink candle was used to, to um, connote a sense of joy. Now, the four themes that are most commonly associated with the weeks of Advent are the themes of hope, love, joy, and peace. Hope, love, joy, and peace. There's a little bit of variety, a little bit of change depending on what source document you go to or what tradition, but the most common are hope, love, joy, and peace. And so today we're going to begin with hope. We're going to begin with hope. Advent is a time for us in a way to, it's a reminder, it's a reminder. Hope is about remembering. And Advent is a reminder to look both ways. Think about that for a moment. To look both ways. A reminder to look to the past and learn from the past. And a reminder to anticipate the future and to be pulled by a vision of what is, of what is possible. To look both ways so that we can empower ourselves in this very moment to do the best and to be the best that we possibly can. And when I think about this idea of looking both ways, I can't help but remember being a kid, growing up and learning from my mom and my dad that before I crossed the street, I needed to stop, look both ways, and then go forward. And just think about that for a moment, the wisdom and practicality of that, not just as it relates to crossing the street, but as it relates to anything significant in our lives, that we need to pause, we need to stop, we need to, to take a breath, and then look both ways and check it out. Look to the past, look to the future before we go ahead and take those bold steps forward toward whatever it is that we're wanting to experience. And so in this season of Advent, in this season of Christmas, I hope that you will take this on as a practice of both remembering and anticipating. I suspect that this Christmas, at least I know in my household, the outer part of it is going to be much more simple. I'm not going to do nearly the decorating that I usually do, and because of sheltering in place, we're not going to have all the church gatherings and parties and so forth. So the outer is going to look very different. But that doesn't change the richness of the inner, which is truly what it is all about anyway. So hope. To me, that is such an important and beautiful word and so incredibly important for us to hold to, to give voice to, and to embody, especially during this time. Not just because it is the, the first Sunday in Advent, but because of the year that we've all been through. It's been a hard year. In the work that I, the pastoral counseling work I used to do and some of the grief work I used to do one-on-one, -on -one, one of the most important aspects of being able to move through times of, of grief is to recognize the sense of loss and allow ourselves to feel it. And so for many of us, that's what this year has been like. There's been so much change. There's been so much 
upheaval. And it's natural for us to feel a sense of grief about that and a sense of angst and loss. However, we cannot allow ourselves to remain in that state. And this is where hope can help pull us up and out and forward. What is hope? To me, hope is many things. One thing it is, is an anticipation of better things to come. Hope is to wait with an open-ended heart. To wait with an open-ended heart. Hope means I don't yet know what the end is, but I believe that it's going to be and can be better than what I'm experiencing right now. I came across this piece from the theologian Henry Nguyen. He's a priest, a Catholic Dutch priest, a writer, and actually a social activist as well. And he was writing this piece about Mary. Think about Mary, the mother of Jesus, when she realized, when she heard, when she was told that she was great with child. Just imagine, he writes, just imagine what Mary was actually saying in the words, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let what you have said be done to me. She was saying, I don't know what all this means, but I trust that good things will happen. Can you relate to that? Can you look at times of your life, and maybe you're in such a time right now, where you look and you say, I don't know what all this means right now. I truly don't. But here's where our spiritual practice comes in, to hold on, to convince ourselves, whether it is through repetition or or associating with people who will, will remind us of this truth, or to read literature that will help us to remember this truth, to trust that good things will happen. Say with me right now, aloud or softly to yourself, I trust that good things will happen. To wait open-endedly is to trust. It's to be ready for the greater good. That's such a a key element and practice of our unity way of living, to be ready for the greater good, to trust that it may not be in my timing, but that it will come to pass. It will come to pass. We often think of waiting as being, being passive, but it really isn't. Not this kind of waiting. I'm not talking about the sit back, do nothing waiting. I'm talking about the waiting that is open-ended and is actively engaged in believing in and trusting that good things will emerge. I came up with this acronym for hope. Hang on, possibilities emerging. Hang on, possibilities emerging. I have three reminders I want to share with you with regard to hope. The first is that hope is about practicing how you're going to look at things. Hope is about practicing how you're going to look at things. Say that to yourself. Hope is about practicing how I'm going to look at things. I was at my hairdresser yesterday. I have been going to Stephen for well over 30 years, so obviously I'm happy with the work that he does. And we were chatting about our Thanksgiving and how different it it was and just the stuff of this year. And he shared with me a a brief story that, that just impacted me because in all the years I have gone to Stephen, I've never quite heard him talk about reframing something in such a clear way. And it had to do with how this pandemic has impacted his art and his craft of hairstyling. He's been using the same hair coloring company and and line for well over 30 years and was trained in a very specific kind of technique that is a little more complicated than than most. And his rep just recently told him that they were discontinuing this line and he was going to have to change out all of his product and figure out a new line that he was going to use for all of his customers and perhaps new training. And he said to me, you know, Wendy, at first I was thinking to myself, what more can go wrong this year? Maybe I should just retire now. And I'm sitting in this chair and thinking, no, Stephen, not now. Please don't retire. Not now. And he said, you know, all of a sudden I decided, but I can choose to look at this differently. I can choose to look at this not as a time to retire, but as, okay, 
I'm going to, at this point in my life, at 66 years old, I'm going to learn how to do it differently. And as I watched him through his mask and could only see his, his eyes and the crinkles around his eyes, as I watched him, I realized just what a true turnaround he had done. Because he said he was basically in tears and sick to his stomach over this. Now, that might not be what would get you in tears or sick to your stomach. But for him, that was. This was a big, big thing. So big that he was thinking of retiring. But then something caused him to make a radical turn in his mind and put a different frame around the whole thing. He chose to look at this completely differently, rather than as a signal to retire as, all right, so I'm going to learn a completely different line and a completely different way of doing it. It reminds me of a story that my minister of many, many years ago now, he's no longer on the planet, uh, Robert Stevens told one Sunday morning. It was about a man who was going door to door selling mag subscriptions to magazines. And when he came to the door and knocked on the door and the, the woman of the house came to the door and answered the door back in those days when that was kind of a, a common thing, she said, I don't, I don't care what you're selling. I'm not in the mood to buy anything. And so he didn't really even have a chance to say much. He started to turn around and walk down the, the stoop. And she noticed that he was limping and walking with a cane. And so she called him back. And she said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Whatever it is you're selling, I'll buy something. And he says, I'm not selling. Pity, ma'am. And she looked at him and, and said, well, I, I see that you're physically challenged. And in those days, you use the word handicapped, right? I see that you're handicapped. And he said, yes, I am. And she said, well, doesn't that color your world? And he said, yes, it does. But thank God I can choose a color. I have never in now well over 40 years forgotten that. Yes, it does color my world. To think otherwise would to be stupid, would be to be in denial. Yes, it does color my world. But thank God I can choose a color. And that is true for you and me. And that is one of the hallmarks of, of, of hope, how we keep hope alive by practicing and reminding ourselves that we have a choice in how we're going to look at things. A second reminder is this, that nothing goes to waste in God's economy. Nothing goes to waste in God's economy. Actually, in Mother Nature, if you think about it, Nothing goes to waste. It's actually inspiring. If you read the, the science behind that, nothing goes to waste in Mother Nature's economy. Nothing goes to waste in God's economy. There is a beautiful fable that comes out of India of a water bearer who used to bring water to his master. He would have to journey quite a distance to gather water. He would carry it on in two large pots across, a, hanging from a pole that would um, go across his shoulders. And he would go and he would fetch the water and he'd fill both of these pots heavy and he'd carry them down to his master and give his master water. But the challenge was one of the pots had a severe crack in it. And that pot that was cracked only arrived to the master half full. And this went on for a long period of time. The water bearer always brought, started with two full pots, but only arrived to the master with a pot and a half full of water. And the pot that was broken, the pot that was damaged, felt really bad because it couldn't help but notice that the other pot always delivered exactly what it was supposed to deliver. That other pot was perfect, and this one was, no pun intended, a cracked pot. And it felt badly that it wasn't fulfilling its mission because it was losing half of its water. And so it apologized to the water bearer one day and said, I am so sorry, you work so hard and you bring, you start with two full pots and you are only able to deliver one and a half. I feel just terrible. And the water bearer said to him, don't feel that way at all. I want you to notice something today as we walk back. I want you to notice that on your side of the path, the side that when I walk down and your pot drips all that water, I want you to notice all the flowers that are growing on that side. For you see, I have always known 
about your flaw. And in knowing about your flaw, I planted flower seeds along your side of the path. And I have always been able to pick those flowers and put them on my master's table. If you notice, as we come back, that there are no flowers growing on the other side of that path. And so you each are perfect and always have been in your own way. In God's economy, nothing is wasted. And we need to look at this as a human family, I think, not just for ourselves individually, but for those in our world who present as different than us in some way. Those who may be marginalized, through no fault of their own, really, those who may be born in bodies that are not functional in the same way that we are, that we have come to call normal functioning, or those who are born neurologically different, and so their brains are wired differently. Can we hold that even in the midst of what, out of our definition of normal, might not seem normal, can we hold that there is perfection there as well. Because when we get to that place in consciousness as a human family, we will literally transform this world. In God's economy, nothing goes to waste. And when we can remember that, we can feel hope rising on us. And the last reminder is one that, that I love. It puts a smile on my face when I, when I think about the story I'm going to use to support it. Is to, to, it is to never forget that the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. How do I know that? I know that because we are ever-evolving, ever-emerging beings. We are co-evolving together. What it means to be a human today is evolved from what it meant eons ago. And why would we think that that evolution of consciousness or that evolution of being is stopping here and now. It's not. It just happens so gradually that we need to consciously and deliberately remind ourselves that the best is yet to be. And as long as we are doing what we can do, that we will be about helping to bring about that best that's yet to be. This story has to do with a congregant, not from our, our church, that... Um, but from a congregant that I had learned of who had gone to her minister to have a serious talk about end-of-life matters because she had been seriously ill for quite some time and her remaining time was shrinking significantly. And she was devoted to her church. She had been a member there for, for all of her life and she wanted to talk to her minister about what she wanted for her funeral service. And so she sat in his office and she said, I, I want, here are the hymns I want, and here are the scripture readings I want, and here's the way I want the service to flow. And, and, and pastor, when, when they put me in my coffin, I want a Bible in one hand and I want a fork in the other. And he looked at her and said, okay, Martha, I know why you want the Bible in one hand, but I don't understand why you want a fork in the other hand. And she said, well, pastor, you know all of these banquets and church potlucks and all of these community gatherings that I have attended here in this church over the years. And every single one of them, there would be a time when the, the people who were clearing the table would come and they'd take away the plates and they'd take away the napkins and the glasses. And every once in a while, every once in a while, the waiter or waitress would say, no, 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 keep your fork. And I knew that that always meant that there was going to be a really good dessert coming because you don't need a fork for jello. You don't need a fork for ice cream. You use a fork for something really good like a piece of pie or a piece of cake. And so I always knew when they said to me the best, when they said to me, keep your fork, I always knew that the best was about to come. And that's what I believe is going to be true for me. And so I want you to bury me with my fork. Now, while I don't necessarily share that woman's precise theology or same theology, I do share the sentiment that the best is yet to come. I believe that for me. 
I believe that for our unity community. I believe that for our country. And I believe that for our world. And even though there may be times that I have to work really hard to keep that belief there, I will never, ever, ever abandon that belief. And I hope that you will hold on to that as well. So hang on. Possibilities emerging. Namaste. We come to the time in our service now where I ask you to take a few moments to be thoughtful and deliberate about the gift that you're going to share with the Unity Center. And even if you give electronically every Sunday or every month, and if you do, I'm sincerely grateful. <laughs>